hello and welcome to Arts24, where we're looking at the next frontier in the world of culture, AI-generated arts. As Paris is host to a major summit about artificial intelligence, we're asking, what does its rise and rise mean for creativity, for the cultural industries, and for the artists who might be replaced by machines? Well, to talk about this, I'm joined by Justine Emard, an artist and researcher who explores the relationship between neuroscience and objects, blending the organic world with the technological frontiers of AI, and Pierre Fautrel, member of the Obvious Collective, who came to worldwide attention when their portrait of Edmond de Bellamy became Christie's first piece of AI-generated art, sold at auction in 2018. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank Good you. to have you here. Now... We're talking about AI, of course, which is present everywhere in the arts and cultural sector, cinema, music, photography. There's been a bit of scepticism, though. Critics saying that the arts and machine-generated content or material are not that compatible. Pierre, the obvious manifesto says that AI can actually boost human creativity. How is that? Yeah, that's what we believe. Uh, we think that AI can help you to be more creative, to help you to do stuff that you cannot do before. And also AI has his own like way to uh, illustrate graphism. Uh, I mean, I can notice when an AI-generated artwork is been, have been created. So uh, there is a very specific types of aesthetics. There is also some different types of algorithms that help you to do different stuff. We consider ourselves as photographers who have different types of optics, for example. And for a specific subject, we choose a specific optics. So mm. uh, we also like to do sometimes music, sometimes uh, video. And that's what AI helps us to do. Mm, generating a new style, a new aesthetic, as you say. But Justine, you also defend this uh, meeting of machine learning technology and the human uh, natural world. What does AI offer you as an artist that sparks your creativity? I think uh, since the new progress of the calculation and the powerness of the machine to generate a new proposition, I think it's a, a way to go beyond human vision, beyond the human mind, and to discover new things. And uh, for example, for me, it was uh, very interesting to replace, replace AI into the field of uh, sciences, because it's not like only online generators, it's also a role process into science and art, and uh, to share the complexity of the processes of creating artworks um, allow us to go beyond something, beyond uh, something that the brain and that the people could uh, imagine. Mm. And for example, there are pieces uh, where you can make a kind of new discoveries, but it's all about the artistic process, how you define uh, your database, how you train the model and what you get as a result. And that's a fascinating uh, way of doing uh, works. Mm, like a conductor of an, mm. an orchestra using your tools differently. And I mentioned, of course, that painting that the obvious collection uh, yeah. sold at auction, one of a series of 18th century style uh, family portraits that you generated. The work is signed by the mathematical formula which generated it. So who is the author or the artist here? Is it the formula or the collective? So the, the reason why we signed with this mathematical formula was to open this debate. And it was in 2018, and the algorithm were like under, uh, like, were still underground at, the, at, the, at that moment. So we wanted to ask the question of the authorship, to ask the question of who is defining the boundaries of art, what is art and what it's not. And AI was a cool stuff to ask those questions. So we were the three of us together in our flats in the center of Paris, asking ourselves those questions. And we'd say, okay, let's ask the world with those questions. Five years, five years later, I think we have uh, an answer to that question. And the answer is, it's obviously the artist. Um, there is no such a thing as an AI algorithm that have a will, that have a will to create, that have uh, choices that are made in terms of production. I mean, it's not the algorithm that choose to to put the artwork in a wooden frame. It's not the algorithm that chose to put this mathematical formula. So uh, the artwork are created by the humans with the new types of tools that help us to create new things, but there is no such a thing as an AI author. Mm, so human desire, human will is always at the, at the source Definitely. of it. Well, Justine, you've made installations that look like they're rooted in the natural world, not virtual. Uh, images from the project uh, Hyper Fantasia sorry, uh, look a little bit like Paleolithic paintings uh, that might have been uncovered uh, deep in rural France. But these are not original cave paintings from tens of thousands of years ago. 
they're a new contemporary imagining of them. Tell us why you chose this very primal reference to human creativity. So this project, uh, Hyperfantasia, the idea was to go into the origin of images, origin of images into the caves. So in France, we have this incredible Chauvet cave where the paintings are dated from 38,000 years ago. And the idea was to connect 30 um, 40,000 years of uh, technology of images from the little piece of coal into the cave until the pixels of the new ways of generating images. And this process process had been a scientific process because I was working with the database from the preservation of the cave, which was a scientific database, to train the model on different corpuses to generate a new proposal, new uh, images of prehistorical paintings. And it was amazing to realize that the process was the same when the men and the women of prehistory were going down into the cave. They were seeing the shape appearing from the surface of the rocks. They could recognize animals and they just came to to um, highlight those shapes. So it's uh, this kind of pareidolia um, uh, thing is, uh, was also the, when you look into the pixels, into the latent space, you discover shapes and your brain is kind of choosing the images. So there is always in AI this uh, choice of the human regarding the human history, regarding how our brain is composed and the machine will never be able to have this uh, judgment. Mm. So it's always important to um, remind the people that uh, art history is uh, coming from the humanity. It cannot be replaced by machines. Mm, and in that way, you're drawing a very long line of art history from the very yes. beginning to, to today and, and, and the future. Well, as I mentioned, every sector of the arts is concerned by AI, including literature. In Japan, the country's most prestigious literary prize has been awarded to an author who said she wrote a around 5% of the novel's text using artificial intelligence tools. And the jury for that prize didn't mind at all. Take a look. A so-called literary scandal that's not caused so much as a ripple in Japan. When Rie Kudan won the 170th Akutagawa Literary Prize, the Japanese author revealed that she'd used AI platforms to help write her novel. I used artificial intelligence for around 5% of the text, and I'd like to carry on using this tool in the future. Her book, Tokyo Sympathy Tower, sold out shortly after she received the award, and her responses to her use of AI were mostly very reasonable. No outrage here. AI is great. However, I do think that human beings still have undiscovered resources. It's true that AI can be quite hard to use for older people. That might create some inequalities. This bookseller believes that AI is now an inescapable part of life and art. For me, AI is preferable. I think that people will naturally end up accepting it. It's difficult to imagine the same response in France, home to the prestigious Goncourt Prize. The 2023 winner, Jean-Baptiste Andrea, has said that the use of AI in literature is totally unacceptable. Justine, I know you've spent plenty of time working in Japan and Korea on projects which involve uh, AI, robotics, uh, machines. We can see the interplay, actually, of the human and the robot in a piece of yours, Co-AI Existence, which was created in Japan, I believe. How would you describe the attitude you encountered in Asia when it comes to integrating AI into artwork? So, as I, as I mentioned, uh, AI is uh, first a scientific field which uh, comes from uh, artificial life. And I was uh, really uh, touched by the work of uh, Takashi Ikegami, he's a scientist in uh, Tokyo. And we started to collaborate together to define new ways of uh, being, new ways of interacting between the machine and the human. So, we had different experiences where we set up like this uh, communication through the 
words, but also through the body, because uh, we are made of flesh, made of bodies. And uh, it was really moving to see that the robot was learning from the human, but the human was learning from the robot as well. And the idea of the embodiment also is something which really interests me, how you embody a digital software into a hardware, like in a robot or in an, an installation, and how you can um, bring this uh, intelligence into the real world to interact with human. So I think this is also interesting uh, to go beyond the screen, beyond the computer, and to create a relation with technology to understand better our humanity as a reflection. Mm. And Pierre, how does that compare to what you've experienced in Europe, uh, especially when it comes to, for example, the status of the artist, <coughs> copyright, that sort of thing? Uh, I totally agree with what uh, Justin just said. I mean, there is a true differences, cultural differences between uh, Europe and Asia, but also between uh, the US, for example, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Europe. Uh, in terms of authorship, obviously, when right now the, art, the artworks are uh, in France under the droit d'auteur, which is like the French protection. Copyright law. Yeah, like the same copyright. So we have the chance to have like the diff I mean, to be protected in France, but I, I guess it will be not, maybe not the case uh, in other countries. But my point is, what I like when we travel with shows is to have different vision. We know we, our last show is about brain-computer interface and how you can connect your brain to a computer. And the differences, the cultural differences on those subjects are very, very strong. Europe tend to be conservative. Europe tend to, like, react first on ethical question and then to treat to see if it's interesting in terms of arts in the US they tend to be like very uh, techy approach try to put the models directly inside the hands of the industries and in in the in Asia it's another different way of abordings those subjects which which Justin just explained so we really like to uh, have the same body of work but to present it to different types of people around the world to see the different cultural the, different, the cultural differences and then to like address it through art. Yeah, and those attitudes are evolving in real time uh, yeah. as we speak. Pierre and Justine, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. We're wrapping up the show with some music and here on Arts24 we thought we'd try our hand at AI creation too. We asked the Suno application to write an energetic, funky song about our culture show and here's what it came up with. The imagery was also generated thanks to AI. Take a look. Do join us next time here for more arts and culture. There's more news coming up just after this. Turn up the rhythm, feel the beat. Oh yeah! Arts 24 coming live, gotta move your feet. From Paris to the world, we bring the heat.